Tenakoto Katoa, and welcome to another Genomics Aotearoa um, seminar. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Richard Espley and Chen Wu from Plant and Food Research. So, uh, if you don't know me, my name is uh, Richard Newcomb, um, and I'm standing in for um, Peter Dearden, who is hopefully making his way to um, Canada to attend a conference or a couple of conferences over there. So um, today, Richard and Chen are going to be uh, talking to us about blue, uh, the Billberry Genome Assembly, how identifying a complex loci is a step closer to breeding a novel anthocyanin-enriched red-fleshed blueberry. I made it. <laughs> oh, that title. <laughs> <laughs> now you try saying that quickly. And yes, John, is it should be locus or that's that's a good question. We'll find out, I think, during the talk how many um, loci there are. So a little bit about Richard and Jen. Uh, Richard Espley is a program leader at Plant Food Research with projects across a range of crops from apple and pear to grape and uh, blueberry. Richard worked on banana as a molecular biologist at Syngenta in the UK before moving to Plant and Food uh, in uh, New Zealand in 2002. Boy, was it that long ago? Yes. He's a molecular biologist focused on the biosynthesis and genetic regulation of plant secondary metabolites. Uh, this involves uh, studying into the uh, biosynthesis and trans transcriptional regulation of uh, polyphenols, particularly anthocyanins, carotenoids, and alkaloids. Richard is interested in aspects of fruit quality and the dietary implications of food and enhanced phytochemical levels. He leads the color and health team based in Auckland. Chen Wu is a bioinformatics scientist at Plant Food Research with one of the main focuses on um, assembling high quality genomes. Uh, uh, genomes Chen has assembled are from stick insect, giant calembola, to bilberry, galenia, and hokey. Uh, she also uh, works on pan genome constructions, variant calling, polyploid genomics, microRNA identification, mainly in kiwi fruit. She started a career at plant and food after graduating with a PhD in insect genomics in Manaki Fenua, Landcare Research, and I had the privilege of being on her supervisory panel. So it's a pleasure to introduce both of you today. I'm looking forward to your talk on bilberry genomics. Oh, thanks, Richard. Um, so th this is the shorter title, Richard, which is the one I thought you were complaining about, but, um, uh, but I'd forgotten there was a much longer title previously. Um, so uh, look, very pleased to be here. Um, uh, Richard and Chen in the room here. I'm going to take my mask off, which I think is permitted while we talk. Um, and uh, Chen is going to give the main part of this talk, which is about um, the genome that she so well stitched together for uh, the bilberry. Um, but what I'm going to do is just give a little bit of context to um, the program, to the project, so that you can hopefully more properly see the impact of having that genome had on, on the program. The authors here are the authors on a, on a paper that, that Chen led, which was for the, the Bilberry genome. Um, and there are aspects that are familiar to us here when we think about indigenous um, uh, uh, plants, and Chen will briefly talk about that towards the end of her talk. Um, but what's this? The, the, the Bilberry genome is part of has been part of a project called Filling the Void, which is an MB program, five year program, um, and actually we've just had the the pleasure of being able to talk to MB and give them a presentation, which was was really good. It was great to engage with the people that have been generous with the money. Uh, but what's it about? It's it's really about trying to produce a a, a new uh, a berry with a sort of novelty and a high health potential. And uh, you'll see on the right there, a blueberry on the far right uh, with, with beautiful dark blue skin, but, but white flesh. And on the left of that is a, a bilberry or European blueberry, which again has beautiful skin color, but is also colored all the way through. So the vision of the program was to try and cross these two, hybridize these two to produce uh, a blueberry that would have all this pigment in the flesh, hence filling the void, because we think blueberry is missing a trick by not having this color. Uh, that would bring a kind of new differentiated product to the market because when you buy a blueberry, it's just a blueberry. 
Um, so, uh, but to do that, uh, we really need uh, good resources and germplasm resources are important as are genomics resources. And we hope that what we can understand about why one berry can have color in the flesh and the other berry can't could also be information that could be transferred to other crops. And there is a focus here on this pigment, this plant pigment called anthocyanin. There's a good reason for that. There's masses of um, uh, data out there to, to, that shows that anthocyanin is very beneficial in our diet, uh, at, at least reducing the incidence of, of, of many um, diseases. So good reason for having it in your diet. The main aims of the program, I'm not gonna go into this, but we had to acquire some germplasm because we didn't have that in this country. Uh, we had to acquire some skills in how to hybridize these two sorts of berries. We needed the genetic knowledge, which is where Chen very much came in to understand the chemistry and to develop some new experimental tools. And ideally what we come away with is some information that helps our breeding program by providing um, markers for marker assisted breeding. Um, and this is just by way of kind of introducing the people on the team. I won't, some, you'll know some of these people. Um, uh, and, uh, but to show you that it's an interdisciplinary kind of program with breeders and people involved in mapping and people involved in metabolomics, so chemists and transcriptomics, so molecular biologists, geneticists. And uh, we've had a, a lovely set of students come through uh, this program from honors to, to, to PhD. And it's really, you know, the people that make a program like this and all of those skills come together to, um, you know, provide the knowledge that we need. So uh, initially we imported uh, plants from uh, the Nordic countries, from as far north as above the Arctic Circle in Tromso to down into Finland. And these were these bilberries now, that might not sound much, but actually importing germplasm into New Zealand um, is quite difficult. And in fact, there is no quarantine space available at the moment. So this was a big thing for us. And at the end of it, we were able to bring in and release after all the virus testing, et cetera, uh, nearly 200 new individual genotypes. And these provide the foundation for our breeding and hybridization activities. Um, but you know, it's really important. This costs a lot of money to bring this stuff into the country. So then we have to try and understand how to grow these and also how to back them up. So for example, tissue culture, we see here across the bottom, bog bilberries, huckleberries and, and bilberries on the right-hand side. So all, all new to New Zealand. So we, all, we kind of had to work out how to grow it and how to protect it. We didn't want to bring these things in and then they suddenly fall over. But I'm very happy to say that we've now got all this germplasm established in a number of different areas in New Zealand and our bilberries coming from the above the Arctic Circle seem, certainly seem to be happy in Clyde where it gets a little bit cooler. Um, but then what we need to do is try and hybridize these different species together. So if you remember, we're trying to get a red fleshed uh, blueberry or red fleshed vaccinium species and we've now made some hybrids between lingonberry and bilberry and between blueberry and bog bilberry. And these are little plants that you see here uh, that haven't fruited yet, but we're very much hoping that we are going to get some, um, some red fleshed fruit. And that's gonna be really useful to try and understand the genetics underneath that. And we know that they are uh, hybrids because we've done PCR testing of those and they have genes from uh, uh, both um, parents and uh, and those genes uh, we've used we've taken them from a gene that we think might control that color and a bit more of that in a minute um, so we will need to wait a year or two before we get the fruit and can analyze those the other thing to do is to uh, kind of um, do some fast improvement so Bilberry is, um, is completely uncultivated. It's never been domesticated, whereas blueberry, for example, has about 100 years of domestication of breeding, mostly in the US. 
Bilberry is only ever collected from the wild across a range of, uh, across Europe. Um, so one of the things we can do is try and manipulate its ploidy level. So it's normally um, a diploid species, and we've now used different methods to increase uh, that ploidy to tetraploid and octoploid. And quite often in horticultural crops, this doubling of genomes is very uh, useful at creating better flowering and healthier plants. So we now have some early plants coming out of that program. And on the left-hand side picture, you see the little um, seedling has just been um, put onto soil uh, that in, in the middle that's growing much quicker than the, and that's a tetraploid growing much quicker than the ones on either side. One, and on the left is a diploid and on the right is an octoploid. So we're really hoping that we will, this will be the start of producing um, a much improved bilberry as a product in itself, as well as doing the hybridization with other vaccinium species. And then really it's about um, developing the resources. We started with nothing and we wanted to understand the chemistry and the transcriptomics uh, that underpin these different berries, the red flesh bilberry and the white flesh blueberry. So we created fruit development series from those berries that we then um, carried out metabolomic analysis, so LCMS and mass spec imaging, and also transcriptomics using, using RNA-seq of these to try and understand what genes were involved in producing the chemistry that we could see from the LCMS. We also have some um, breeding populations of blueberry in uh, uh, Motueka at PFR, and we're using these to try and map QTLs for color, although because it's blueberry, it's only in the skin. But these are really useful resources to have. And once you start getting big data sets uh, of transcriptomics and metal metabolomics, um, clever people in our, in our uh, team were able to analyze those two data sets and co-correlate them so that we could understand which genes may be involved in which um, metabolite, or for example, with the anthocyanins, what genes are involved in making anthocyanins in the flesh of a bilberry. And this is a terrible thing to show on a Friday afternoon, but it's a biosynthetic pathway that culminates in those colored pigments and those anthocyanins. But what we found when we brought all that data together, that, um, that the blueberry was producing one set of uh, uh, compounds, chemicals, whereas the bilby was producing different sets of chemicals, which showed us that the pathway was activated at, at, uh, in a different way. And, um, sorry, the, uh, the other thing that we did is we wanted to see where those particular chemicals were uh, produced. Now, normally when you look at um, metabolomics, when you look at all the compounds in tissues, you just use a homogeneous sample. We wanted to try and see if there was any kind of developmental cues to uh, this anthocyanin uh, coming on in the flesh of bilberry. And so uh, one of the team members, Andrew Dare, formed a collaboration with the med school here in Auckland and used this very fancy piece of kit. Um, I think it's the only one in, um, in New Zealand. And I've got a little film here, which will tell you about it. And then I can stop talking for one minute and you can listen.
Well, I, I hope you're able to see that and uh, hear the mat that and the, and the, the drum crescendo at the end. Um, the trouble is giving these talks, I can't see the audience at all, so I don't know whether anyone's still there, which is a bit alarming. Um, anyway, the last bit really I'm going to talk about before I hand over to Chen, uh, which was, so we've got a fairly reasonable handle now on the chemicals and how they're produced and where they're produced. And the other thing is, you know, this, this colour in fruit is all about um, attracting really uh, seed dispersers, animals, whatever, insects to go and um, uh, disperse the seed. Uh, and at the start, when fruit are being developed uh, early on, you know, they're full of tannins and, and it's basically a signal saying, don't eat me. You know, I'm not ready to eat yet. My seed hasn't developed, so don't eat me. And then as those tannins come down, the anthocyanins come up and that's a signal to say, uh, come and eat me. So there must be uh, um, genes that are involved in controlling that process. It's an ordered process uh, that, that goes from, from one, one set of chemicals to another. And um, from some previous work, we know that it's like to be transcription factors and mid transcription factors at the heart of that um, controlling pathway. But of course, without a genome, uh, we don't necessarily know what those genes might be. Um, but once we had a genome um, to, to play with, we could look at the genes involved and there's pictures here uh, of people peeling frozen bilberries and blueberries, which was a nightmare of a job, but everyone looks quite happy. But what we've got now is we can do some transcriptomics on these uh, samples, the skin and the flesh. And you'll see uh, with the blueberry, um, there is uh, uh, in the skin, the expression of this gene, this MIB and nothing in the flesh. Whereas in bilberry, we see this expression coming up in the flesh and we think that is very uh, important for, for, for flesh color. And from that, you can start to produce models of what's going on in the fruit. So you can really start to work out the systems that are involved. And we had a lovely PhD student, Declan, who's now gone into postdoc in, in, uh, in the US uh, doing a lot of this work and eventually finding a kind of model for anthocyanin. So that's a lot of background, sorry, but I could, I could give you a lot more, but I think now one more slide from me, and this is just one of the ways of functionally proving that a gene does what we think it does is to uh, use uh, transformation. And here we've got the gene in blueberry, um, on the right hand side there producing these red plants and uh, red uh, flowers and we just have some fruit now coming on in the glass house in Palmerston North so we're hoping that it will have red flesh as well kind of helping to prove our hypothesis. Now I'm very happy to hand over to Chen to talk to you about the main part of this. Thank you Richard. Thank you. Um... So um, for the genome sequencing of bilberry, um, the leaf sample of a wild ecotype was collected from northern Norway. Um, and we know that the genome is a diploid and has a size of around 600 megabases, and there are 12 chromosomes. The Oxford, Oxford nanopore technology was used for the whole genome sequencing, and we also obtained the um, whole genome data and also the high C data from the Illumina sequencing. Um, the DNA extraction and library preparation of um, um, Oxford nanopore sequencing um, run was done in-house by Elena Hilario, and the majority of reads was obtained from a Permethrin run. And you can see that for the Permethrin run, we had um, the N50 lens of the long reads of about 22K basis. And we also have um, a few very long uh, reads, which uh, are around 100K basis, which was good. And for the whole genome Illumina rates, we obtained like over 200 times coverage of the genome. And also based on the estimation of the informative rate pairs rate um, from the high C data, we see that it was like almost 10% um, of them actually can, 
be really helpful for the high seas scaffolding, which was also good. However, when we did a KMAR analysis on the whole genome domina data, we found there that um, there were several euro peaks present in the profile. And we all know that for a diploid genome, there are usually just two peaks representing the um, heterozygous regions and uh, also the uh, homozygous regions respectively. But um, in our case, it looks like um, there are three peaks and also one uh, slightly raised shoulder um, in the middle as well. So the distance between the nearby peaks actually are identical. So what's going on with uh, this data? Um, if it's not polyploid, uh, maybe it's from some contaminations um, that happen to form this kind of profile. But based on our analysis, the contamination rate was really low. It's only like a couple of percent um, of the rates came from uh, um, bacterial or like ext um, external species. So we had this hypothesis that maybe the sample uh, was actually contained more than one plant. So we did um, experiment uh, to do SSR fingerprinting using 26 blueberry markers, but however, we didn't find any um, evidence from that. We saw it was because those markers didn't fall into the regions that are diverged between the individuals. So we decided to look at the SNPs and short index indels from mapping the shock rates, whole genome shock rates to and one of the initial assembly. So actually for a tetrapoid genome, um, you would see that um, three peaks at alternative allele frequency around 0 0.25, 0 0.5 and 0.75. Um, for, in our case, we do see three peaks. So we think that it probably makes, uh, the sample is mixed with two plants, but the ratio is kind of uh, shift a little bit to the left, which indicated that the amount of DNA extracted from the two plants are actually probably different. So um, when you look at this bilberry bush, it's a little bit mess. <laughs> so <laughs> the branches from different plants actually cross each other and knit together. So if you don't collect the sample really carefully, it is likely that the samples mix with multiple <laughs> plants. Um, however, we still decided to go uh, for the typical genome assembly workflow that, um, that was back to the time uh, it was very popular to assemble the nanoporates to the uh, genome assembly. So basically the first step was the QC step to um, quality assess the different type of reads. And then the nanoporates was assembled using multiple assemblers to compare with the um, outcomes. And then we selected the best initial assemblies for polishing, contamination removal, and also for the final step to use the high C data to assign the cortic sound to the chromosome level. So all the analysis was done on Nancy cluster as well as the internal PFR cluster. And we also looked at both goal scores, mapping back rate, LAI, Synteny, and high heat heatmap, and also uh, telomeres to assess our samples. Um, well, uh, during the workflow, and uh, we have this question like um, to select the best initial assemblies for the further um, assembly steps. So our goal was to generate a haplotype genome assembly it's just because we had this mix of sample problems and this, um, this was a lot easier and there were actually no very good solutions to face uh, haplotypes from our situations uh, back the time. So basically to justify which initial assemblies that we are gonna use uh, for our final uh, genome, um, we uh, decided to map the long reads to the four assemblies to look at the read coverage across every one of the assembly. 
So um, in this picture, the green line represents the, um, the red coverage um, profile of the uh, of mapping the rates back to the NICAD assembly. So you can see that the first peak is really high. Um, and also it has a relatively high misassemblies rate. If you look at the very beginning of the line, it's um, also uh, relatively high. And um, NICAD actually does a aggressive error correction on the row long rates um, as the first step of assembling a genome. So you imagine that if you have a mix of sample problems, when you correct the row rates, you might have the problems with like generating more misassemblies. And also the NICAD assembly is really large. It's about 1.4 gig. So it maintains lots of alleles in the assembly. We wasn't happy with this assembly. So, um, when, um, so next we looked at the WTDBG2 assembly. Uh, so the purple line represented the profile of this assembly um, after mapping rate back. So you can see that there is a really high misassembly rate um, over there at the beginning of the profile. And also in this assembly, it has the lowest POSCO rate. Uh, Postcode score. So we decided to discard this assembly as well. For the fly assembly, it shows the red line shows uh, a similar profile with the camera analysis. Um, but this assembly was quite fragmented and it's also maintained quite a lot of alleles as well. And when we look at the Shasta assembly, um, it actually has a lowest misassembly rate and also a lot of alleles clapped together. And it has the highest homodiagus peak. So we decided to take fly assembly and shasta assembly to do a synteny check against uh, the blueberry chromosomes. Both of them actually show very high conservation um, in synteny analysis. Um, however, the Shasta assembly is a lot more continuous. So it's only um, just uh, like um, have almost 3,000 colleagues. Well, the fly assembly have over 7,000 colleagues. So we decided to take Shasta assembly to do the chromosome level assembly construction. So in the end, we achieved a chromosome level assembly of 522 megabases representing 96.6% Posco score, Posco completeness. And also this assembly has a quite good LAI score. And this uh, is the heat map generated from all the chromosomes uh, that with the high seed atom map to this. So this um, Kentek map indicates, actually indicates the presence of putative central metric regions um, it's pointed by the black arrow over there. And if you look at the chromosome two and chromosome six, the location, the region actually shift a little bit from the middle. And then um, we did a synteny check uh, using the blueberry chromosomes, I guess the blueberry chromosomes and also the cranberry pop. A chromosome, and you can see both of them have very high conservation synteny. And then we think that we achieved a quite good assembly. So the next step is to do the annotation uh, um, steps. In Cecilia, I designed this workflow and uh, proceed every one of the steps. Rather than only have the RE6 data to support the annotation, we, had only, we also had some RNA. Uh, RNA ONT rates, which uh, help with the annotation as well. So overall, um, the annotation shows almost a half of the genome annotated as red pits. And if you look at the highest, uh, the location of the highest density of TE or gypsy repeats across every one of the chromosome, they actually correlated to the central meric locations. Um, even for the chromosome two and chromosome six that have the central meric locations shifted a little bit, are still correlated with the highest density of repeats. 
and uh, we annotated over 36 solvent genes, uh, which representing 95% uh, postcode completeness. And our scientists uh, um, also uh, specifically look at the MIP lockers. So I guess this correct the title. <laughs> this is a, a lockers, this is not loss. Um, so this lockers that, that Richard mentioned before, it's uh, color related. Um, and it has been demonstrated with a very complex lockers. So it contains multiple gene copies and also have quite a few repeats in between. So in the Bilbrey genome assembly, this lockers was highly resolved and it was present on one single cortic and all the transposon elements were fully annotated. We also found a stop coding in the middle of a MIP A4 exon, and it was confirmed by mapping all the uh, short and long rays back to the region. So if you look at the right hand, the, um, the Bilberry MIP blockers, you will see that there are quite a few gaps, which resulted in um, actually the fragmented genes. So um, overall our Bilberry genome results actually um, provide very good opportunities for people to look at those complex regions. And we conclude that our uh, Bilber genome is uh, very complete. And um, the work uh, has been published uh, on molecular uh, ecology resources. And we also included the biocultural notice because there were uh, the inputs from the Sami people um, uh, writing some of the introductions and also um, sample collection in Sami regions. So those people actually are the Europe's uh, only indigenous people. And right now only around 80,000 of the population. We would like to thank the Filling the Void team, which helped a lot with this publication, and also the funding work came from uh, MBIE, Genomics, Acura, and VECAP. And we have those uh, collaboration, collaborators from Europe, and uh, the two uh, at the right hand are the collaborators from US. Our Bilberry uh, Genome Assembly has been contributing to uh, the construction of the pen genome in Vaccinum, and currently it is stored um, in the genome database for Vaccinum. And we also would like to um, say something about our exciting population study in Bilberry. It is a worldwide collaboration to look at population genetic structure, adaptation, and resilience to climate change in Bilberry. So currently there are over 100 plants sequenced already, and um, there are more samples and data on the way. Um, so if you look at this picture, the dots actually represent the locations, um, either that we have the samples already or we are going to do some sampling. And one of our collaborators uh, actually at the moment is at the Faroe Island to collect <laughs> some samples, so that's amazing. Um, and this is gonna be um, some big uh, studies as well. So um, I guess that's all we want to talk about uh, um, the Bilber work. Uh, thank you for your attention. And we are very pleasure to answer any of the questions. Uh, thank Chen and Richard for a very entertaining talk and uh, and showing us not a, not only the um, uh, some fundamental genomics but the utility of it in um, in, a, in a nice application there. So thank you very much, Richard and Chen, and thanks everyone for um, participating. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you.